In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, trust doesn't come so easily, does it? Call me cynical, but people today are much quicker to doubt, to distrust, to be skeptical about another person than they are to accept that person to, to trust them. For, for most people, it usually, takes, it usually takes a whole lot of time, a lot of time and effort on the part of the other person to gain that person's trust. So it shouldn't surprise us when, when you and I find ourselves being skeptical. When I'm not so quick to extend my trust to another person. When you're, when you, when you're not so sure about the trustworthiness of a group or an organization. After all, we live in a skeptical age. We live in a, in a world where skepticism is pretty common. We live in a world where organizations and companies, leaders and individuals, always seem to be trying to take advantage of us. Or at least, perhaps they have, or have tried to do so in the past. For example, scamming is one of the most common crimes out there, especially on the internet. That's why you have a spam folder where you send all those junk emails from some foreign country saying you won a billion pounds. Also, too, uh, identity theft is a very lucrative business for out there where they try to steal your information and use your name and, your rep and, and what you have out there, your credit history, to get as much as they can for themselves. If that, doesn't, if that doesn't rob you of your willingness to trust, then scandals and corruptions in government at every level, in churches, in, in companies, that just might do it. You see it in advertising as, as businesses promise you this fantastic deal, but then they never tell you how poor, or how bad their customer service is, or how poor their materials really are. You're getting a great deal, but you're going to pay for it in the end. What's even, it's no wonder that we're skeptical. You can't, you can't help but just, just get frustrated when, or, or full of doubt or whatever when you, when you see another car dealer blaring away on your TV and offering you another huge deal. Or, or some lawyer offering you a ton of money in a settlement. And this lack of trust strikes even closer to home. Have you ever been burned by someone you know or someone you love? Perhaps a family member, a friend, a classmate, a co-worker, even a, a fellow Christian. It's no wonder that trust is so rare among us, even among Christians. What's even sadder is that because we've all grown so skeptical, so cynical about so much in our world, we apply that skepticism, that doubt to Jesus and his word. We have a hard time trusting Jesus. Oh, I believe him as my that he is my I believe in him as my savior, but will he really come through for me? Will he really answer my prayers? Does he really have the power and authority to do all that he has said? Can I trust Jesus? Now in Luke 7, our gospel lesson for today, we hear about someone you'd expect to be the last person to be trusting. You would expect that Roman centurion to be more skeptical than most people. He definitely wasn't the type of person who would be willing to extend his trust to a Jewish rabbi named Jesus. But yet he does just that. Now Jesus had made his way back to Capernaum, the city of Capernaum, uh, right on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. It was his base of operations for most of his public ministry. When he arrived, a group of elders, of Jewish elders, came rushing up to Jesus and, and started begging him. Someone was dying. Who was it? Was it one of them? Was it one of their kids? Who was it? It was none of them. It was the servant of a Roman centurion. They had been personally sent by a local centurion to ask Jesus to heal his servant, whom he valued highly. That servant was sick and about to die. Now that centurion, at some point, had been in command of a hundred Roman soldiers. But he was more than just a commander of troops. He was a lot more like what a modern Navy SEAL. 
an adjusted officer. A Roman centurion was among the best Roman soldiers in skill, in leadership, in courage, and in loyalty to Caesar and the Roman Empire. A Roman centurion would stand out in his culture and in society. He was adored by his neighbors and feared by his enemies. This is the cream of the crop of the Roman Empire, of the Roman army. Now, unlike so many centurions who most of them died on the battlefield, this one had hung around long enough, won enough battles, and survived them that he could put down some permanent roots in Galilee. In fact, this centurion had even come to, to love the local Jewish people. He loved them as his own. He cared for them as he care, had cared for his own soldiers. He cared for his servant who was sick and dying. He didn't want him to die. He had such care for his people that the Jewish leaders actually told Jesus, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. Centurions were not known for their compassion and kindness, especially towards a people like the Jews who constantly were in revolt or rebellion against the empire. You'd expect this man to be hardened and cynical, a hardened, skeptical warrior, trusting no one and depending on himself for everything. But when this centurion heard about Jesus, he sent those elders to ask him for help. This centurion was risking a lot. What were he, the other Roman soldiers to think about this appeal he's making to this Jesus. What were the other Jews who didn't know his kindness? What were they going to think about him? But none of that mattered. Because this centurion trusted Jesus. So Jesus went with those elders and he would provide the healing that that servant needed. But along the way, not far from the house, the centurion sent, we're told the centurion sent friends to say to Jesus, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed, for I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. <coughs> Jesus was so amazed. Jesus, amazed. He was so amazed that he told the crowd, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Now what's the big deal? It's just a, someone trusting Jesus to be able to do what he has promised. <clears throat> but there was much more to the humble trust of this Roman centurion than simply, simply humbling, humbly asking Jesus to heal his servant. He recognized that as a sinful human being, he didn't deserve to stand in the presence of Jesus. He realized who Jesus was. He re recognized, he knew that, by, and by faith, but by faith he knew that all Jesus had to do was speak the word and his servant would be healed. As a centurion, he demanded and received instant and unquestioned obedience. As soon as he made the command, it was done yesterday. His own obedience to his superiors and to his emperor was just as instant and unquestioned. Amazingly, he was anxious to apply that same unquestioning confidence to the spoken word of Jesus. He completely trusted that the sickness would obey Jesus' very command. That it would go away as soon as Jesus said it. He was, to use the definition that the Apostle Paul uses, he was fully persuaded that Jesus had the power to do what he had promised. And the Spirit through the power of God's Word had made the centurion bold enough to come to Jesus for healing and for life. Just think about that. A hardened, skeptical, self-sufficient Roman centurion trusted that Jesus could do what he had promised. That wasn't something that centurion had generated in his heart. There was no possible way that could happen. But that trust flowed from a faith that the Holy Spirit had planted in his heart through the Word of God. The centurion somewhere along the way had heard about Jesus' miracles. He had heard about how Jesus had healed the sick and preached with authority and, and even cast out demons. And that word, the Spirit worked on his heart through that word to give him that trust that was more than just, well, perhaps, maybe, possibly, he might maybe 
heal my servant, or at least make him feel a little better. No, this was trust that Jesus could do everything he had promised. It's no wonder Jesus was amazed at him. This is the first recorded instance in the Gospels of a Gentile, a non-Jew, actually responding in faith to the ministry of Jesus. Of course Jesus healed the servant. He did just as he had promised. We're told the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. The centurion knew he could trust Jesus with his servant's life. But can you trust him with your life? With everything going on in your life? With everyone in your life? You and I live in a cynical, skeptical world. Being slow to trust and quick to doubt comes naturally to nearly every one of us. We pride ourselves on being independent, on being self-sufficient, on not needing to depend on anyone and often demanding that the other person do the hard work to earn our trust. Sadly, the same can be said about our approach to Jesus and His Word. It's very easy to trust Jesus when you're here on Sunday morning, sitting here in church. But what happens when you get that phone call on Monday night that a loved one was seriously hurt in a car accident? Or that when you've been asked to come into your boss's office on Tuesday afternoon? Or when you have that doctor's appointment on Wednesday morning? Or when your friends let you down on Friday night? What happens to that trust? It's easy for us as Christians to detach ourselves from Christ and His promises during the week and forget how vital and relevant and necessary He and His promises are for us every single day. We believe in Jesus, but we don't trust Him. So how can you trust Jesus? How can you be like that Roman centurion and trust Jesus to fulfill His promises? Well, as I mentioned with the kids... Consider the Savior's track record when it comes to fulfilling those promises. The centurion, as I mentioned, had heard of Jesus. People had told him. He was there in Capernaum where Jesus had done all kinds of great things. Healing the sick. Feeding many people with five loaves of bread and two fish. All kinds of other miracles. Casting out demons and preaching with authority. He had heard from the people about that. And he knew that Jesus, for that reason, was more than just another Jewish rabbi, another Jewish prophet. He was something more. Now when you look at Jesus' track record and his track record, what do you learn? This Jesus never broke a promise, never failed to come through, never hesitated to do what his father commanded him to do. He did it instantly and without question. When the right time in history came, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary. All those promises of the Old Testament about this Messiah, this Anointed One, this Savior who is going to come, they, every single one of those promises, Jesus fulfilled. From the place of His birth in Bethlehem, to the nature of His death on the cross, to the empty tomb and death defeated on Easter Sunday, Jesus did it all. Not only did he have the power to do all those things, to fulfill all those promises, but he actually did it. And that's what impacts your life and mine. What about your sins of doubt and skepticism? Well, guess what? Jesus took those to the cross. They were nailed there on that cross. They were paid for there on that cross. And then his very real empty tomb, that guaranteed, sealed, proved, that every one of those sins has been forgiven. Is life in this skeptical world robbing you of any reason to trust? Well, Jesus comes through for you with joy and peace and hope that the world cannot give to you. He never tries to take advantage of you. He never turns his back on you. Jesus never, ever fails you. He never lets you down. He never fails to be there when you need him most. In fact, he gives you the assurance assurance of blood and in a vacant tomb that someday you're going to be in heaven with Him, that place where you will no longer need to be skeptical at all. Can I trust Jesus? Can you trust Jesus? Yes! Yes, you can! Like the Roman centurion by faith, we trust Jesus to do what He has promised. To bless us. 
to be with us, to save us. Like that centurion by faith, we entrust our lives, every aspect of those lives, everything going on in our lives, all the people in our lives, we entrust to Him, into the almighty and merciful care of our Savior God. <coughs> Savior God who loves us and gave Himself for us. When it comes to Jesus and His Word, you have absolutely no reason to be skeptical or cynical. Jesus always comes through. May that same Savior give to you and me a confidence that is both bold and unquestioning. A confidence that is completely and totally based in Him. Amen.